Good morning. Don Steele, continuing with part 20 of what I've learned over the past 81 years. Some of it is funny, some of it is sad, some of it is smart, and some of it is really dumb. Some of the stuff I did is really dumb. Here's a story about my ex-wife, Joanna, learning how to be an actor in Hollywood. She uh, got the idea that she wanted to be an actor. She was a singer, and she was very good on stage, but the, the uh, band members kept telling her she has to interact more with the audience while she's getting ready to sing. She has to talk to them, how are you doing tonight, blah, blah, blah. And she had a very hard time doing that, so she took acting classes so she could be an actor and do that. And she just fell in love with acting. She thought it was the most fun thing she'd ever done. She was going to a school in West Hollywood in uh, Santa Monica called Meisner, the Meisner Method. A lot of famous actors have graduated from there. I think De Niro is the most famous. And uh, she got very good at it. And she couldn't get a job, of course, because <laughs> you heard the story about Kathleen a year and a half for pounding the pavement. And I told her that story. But you have to, you really have to give it a thousand percent. You have to have a burning desire to be an actor in your soul because the rejections are just going to be constant. So her, her teacher suggested she get a job as an extra. And there's a place called Central Casting and you go there and you give them your name and your height and, and pictures and, and they put you in a computer. And then when the casting director is looking for somebody certain type to do this part, she got the job working on a TV show that was being shot in a hospital. So she dutifully goes down there and they have all the extras sitting here and they're shooting a scene and the scene involves uh, a lot of yelling. She can hear people yelling in that hospital room over there. They're practicing. A wheelchair's got to come by the door and then the door has to open and then actor one has to come out and actor two has to go the other way and they keep fucking it up and the extras are over here watching all this. All three actors that were in the room come out and the last one to come out walks out, turns towards her and walks at her and gives her a look. Just looks at her. She, it scared the shit out of her. She thought, man, that guy's nuts. <laughs> First thing she thought of. He turned his back to her and he went over and sat in one of those director chairs way over there. And she was glad he was there. She was kind of watching him out of the corner of her eye. Then she shot her stuff. She was a nurse going that way and there was another nurse coming that way down the hall in the wheelchair and all that stuff. They got that and then they let all the extras go for the day for that's all they needed. And I asked her, well, what was the show? show? And she said, something called Dexter. I don't even know what it is. It's about a serial killer. And I said, okay, a couple years go by and we're watching Dexter on HBO. <laughs> and the man she saw was uh, Michael C. Hall and he was in character. He was in character as a serial killer and he was pissed off about his father dying in that room. So he stayed in character. He walked out here, stayed in character and he sat and watched the wall. He doesn't want to watch all this trivia shit. He's got to stay in this nutty character. And if you never got to see Dexter, here's a little clip from Dexter to show you how crazy the guy was able to look. Poor woman. A child. So which one of you thought this up? They get freedom. We free them. They thank us for God's sake. For drowning them and dumping their bodies in the ocean, please. I can pay you. We have money. That's what it's all about, right? I love you. I love you so much. I love you so much. So that's, I never use that example when I do radio interviews about body language or television interviews about body language, but I should. I always use uh, Hannibal the Cannibal, how he is just this meek little mild Englishman in the real life and he can act like Hannibal the Cannibal and all he has to do is use his body language and his face and a few words and you, you're convinced this guy eats people for a living. <laughs> well, Michael C. Hall can do anything. If you've ever seen Six Feet Under, fantastic six-year TV show, has the best ending of any TV show ever. The producer or director of uh, Six Feet Under said, I won't do it unless I can have Michael C. Hall be 
in the show. So he got his way and he was in six feet under and probably wrote his own meal ticket the whole time because he is so good. Just watch either one of those shows and you'll see what an actor can do. And then if you see him in an interview, he's just a normal person like you and me. He can sit there and talk to you, but then all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, they really have to work at it to get into those crazy characters. But that's one of the advantages of living in California. You get to do all, learn all this stuff like this. I have a friend for life, Guy Zip. He's originally from New York. He moved out here in the late 80s, mechanical engineer, got a job in aerospace. And I met him at McDonnell Douglas and we were good friends. We knew all the, we, had, we were both very good joke tellers and we told each other jokes all the time and compared notes, we were both car nuts. And we just hit it off and he's a really nice guy on top of it. He's 6'5", 230 pounds. And he played semi-pro football. Never, met, never had enough talent to make the pros, but big and dangerous. If anybody just looked at him, they stepped aside. Before I met him, he was telling me a story about being in this famous pickup bar that was had a long, just had nothing but a long bar, a whole bunch of stools, a dance floor here, and then over there were, were the tables. So a guy used to go into the bar part and stand down near the end, make a bullshit with the, with the bartender and flirt with the cocktail waitresses when they came to pick up their drinks. So in this 100 seat bar, he's looking down that way. It's maybe about 10 o'clock on a Friday night and the crowd is just starting to happening and dancing is going. And now the music stops and a group of girls come in and they all are sitting on the bar stools facing that way. And guys checking them out, looking at them. And all of a sudden, two girls start going at it, punching and scratching, pulling their hair, and they fall off their bar stools and they're going at it on the floor. And all of a sudden, the boyfriends come over here and they get into it. One, and then they start, boys start punching each other, and then some more guys on each side. And pretty soon, there's a melee. And all of a sudden, the big uh, security guards come in and they grab everybody and throw them out. And it's all quieting down. And Guy Zip is standing against the wall over there. And the bartender said, are you from New York? The guy said, yeah, how'd you know? He says, well, when the shit started down there, you picked up your beer and you stood against the wall until it was all over. That's right. New Yorkers don't give a fuck. If you want to kill each other, that's fine. I'm not getting involved. I asked Guy about it. He said, Christ, one of those people that have a gun, you don't know what the hell's going on there. I don't care if those girls beat each other up. I don't care. <laughs> That's a New Yorker attitude. It's my attitude, naturally. I told you about my girlfriend, Chris, who went to UCLA. In her second year, she got a, an apartment off campus with a couple other girls. And it was uh, one of those things where there's a, a condo, uh, two bedrooms upstairs and one bedroom downstairs. And it had uh, a little patio, a sliding glass door, like probably most apartments everywhere now. And uh, Chris came home one night to see a naked man grabbing her, one of her roommates and trying to flip her around and bend her over so he could fuck her. And Chris picked up a ball bat and started, there was a ball bat sitting by the door and she started beating on that fucker. And he let the girl go and she beat him all the way out to the sliding glass door, which was open. She kept hitting him as he's climbing over the over the cement block wall and running away. A naked man running away in Brentwood. Okay, this is where really fucking rich people live. And the cops never found him. There's blood all over the place. Our LAPD at work. So she said, what should I do? And I said, well, you should move to a place where there's not a sliding glass door on the first floor. <laughs> That's too easy to get in. So she moved with a couple of her uh, friends and they moved on to the second floor. No, no way to get up to the second floor. So they felt a lot safer there. That's the other thing about LA. There's lots of nuts. <laughs> the land of fruits and nuts, California. I made friends with a guy who interviewed me for my book. He was, uh, he called me when I was in Hawaii. And when I moved back to California, he was coming to California and he asked if he could stop and visit us. So he did, nice guy. And uh, he was going to write a story about uh, the guy that made movies about girls with big tits, Russ Meyer. 
Alex was going to interview Russ Meyer, and he had the ends with the guy. And he was just telling us how to do that. But in the meantime, he uh, couldn't get a job doing anything, so he, got, he wrote a script on spec for The Simpsons after The Simpsons had been on for quite a while. And somehow he got his script made. The Simpsons bought it from him. And he was just surprised to anybody, but he said, oh man, I'm, I'm on my way now. Once you sell a script to The Simpsons, you're there. No, it didn't work out. They asked him to write another script. They didn't like it. And that was the end of that poor guy. That was a gold mine. He was uh, visiting with us one afternoon. He was talking about where he lived in New York. He, his car radio kept getting stolen. So he moved out to Brooklyn, thinking it would be better out there. And he was moved into a house with a bunch of other guys on a side street. One day he asked one of the old men that lived on that street, he said, you know, I used to get my car radio stolen when I lived in the, over in town. And the guy said, well, you won't get anything stolen on this street. And he said, why not? He said, this is where all the mafia, retired mafia guys live. Nobody fucks with anybody around here. And my, my innocent little third wife goes, there really is a mafia? <laughs> Yep, there really is a mafia. It's Sopranos is for real, okay? It's not just a TV show. <laughs> I'm from a real small town, 258 people. And every summer, the volunteer firemen used to have the traveling carnival stop in Shippenville. And we had this big empty lot in the middle of town. And uh, they would set up the Ferris wheel and uh, chairs that were on big chains that would spin around. Those were the only two rides they had, and the rest were, you know, hustles of some kind. Pitch a, pitch a dime in the win the dish and throw the ball. And there was a new game where the guy had uh, the counter was about this high. I was maybe 14, about as tall as I am now. And there was a a V, two two pieces of wood nailed on the on the on the wood that I was leaning on, shaped like a V. And he took a bowling pin, regular bowling pin, and he set it in the V. And then there's a miniature bowling ball about that big hanging on a chain. And he says, okay, it's very simple. It's ball up, don't hit the pin on the way out, and then knock the pin down when it comes back. And he did it a couple of times. He let me do it a couple of times. And so you put your money down, 10 cents, yeah, I can do that. You can win 30 cents if you, if you hit it on the way back. And I pushed it out there and it came back and I missed it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm so careful, I'm trying to make sure I got it like that. And I must have spent $2 trying to knock that pin over. So I told my dad about it. He says, well, I don't know how they're doing it. Maybe there's a pedal under there they tramp on or something moves or something. But I'm, so the next time I'm done, I'm watching everything. I'm watching up there and I'm watching his legs and nothing. He's standing over there when we're trying to do it. So I told my physics teacher in high school, Mr. Wise, about it. I said, I told him what it was. He said, oh, John, a pendulum, if it goes, if it misses an eighth of an inch on the way out, it's going to miss an eighth of an inch on the way back. That's the way pendulums work. That's why they're used as clocks. So what the guy was doing was on the, on the V that was on the top of the counter, is he would set the bowling pin a little bit off to one side when it was free. So you'd go out and sure enough, it would hit on the way back because it was on that side to start with. But when you were trying, you put it right in the middle of the V. And if you missed it on the way out, you were going to miss it on the way back. I learned physics about pendulums in a carnival. Before you understand or even believe this next story, I've got to show you this photograph. This is what Mexican girls do. They shave off their eyebrows and then they paint them on. Don't ask me, it's a very strange subculture in LA. My daughter's hospital, my daughter is a uh, delivery room nurse, and now she's pure cesarean only. She was a baby catcher, the head nurse in the delivery room for 10 years. And uh, then she hurt her shoulder holding up the leg of the 300 pound Mexican, the illegals that are in there having a baby. She has to hold it up with this hand to reach in with that hand to pull the baby up. So she, her shoulder got screwed up. And they wanted to operate. She knows better than that. So she said, no. And they said, either you get it fixed 
where you can't have your job back. And the union was on the side of the hospital, very strangely. So she went to physical therapy, and I guess that's a real motherfucker. But she got her arm so she could use it again. But she wouldn't go back in the living room. So they put her in a cesarean where all her skills are the same, except she doesn't have to reach in and pull the baby out. The doctor's doing that. In the other regular delivery room, the girls do everything. The nurses do everything. And they call the doctor if they don't know what to do. If it's a cesarean, it's all doctors. So she's in there now, doesn't have to lift any legs up, and tells many funny stories about women <laughs> and the kind of people they work on. God, it's horrible. 70% of the births in her hospital, uh, Long Beach Memorial, are from illegal women. Zero money to the hospital except from the government. So all the girls that are having babies are Mexican illegals, most of them. And they do this eyebrow thing. So every once in a while, the hospital, like any other organization, somebody dies or gets divorced or quits or something, and they need to hire temporary nurses. And there are women who do that all over the country. Cindy has a good friend who is based in somewhere in Oklahoma and does six weeks at this hospital, six weeks at that hospital, moves all around the country and enjoys it, likes that life. So she was here, uh, I would say in 2006 or seven, and Joanna was in a band. Cindy wanted to bring her nurse friends to come and see the band. Joanna could imitate all the male singers in ACDC, Iron Maiden, Ozzy Osbourne, she could, she could sound just like them. Okay, so people would come from all around and see her do her act. And Whittier Hilton on Friday night is uh, basically full of Mexicans because Whittier is 80% Mexican now, 80 20. And uh, the Hilton is one of the few places in Whittier, a former Quaker town that now serves liquor. So the hotel is allowed to serve liquor in the bar. What happens is at midnight, the, all the bars except Steve's, which is a dangerous place, biker, bikers go in there. And the hotel are the only ones open after 12. So all the college kids who are in the beer bars come down to the Hilton. And Cindy and her nurse friends are with me. We're all sitting at one end of the bar. We, were got, we got there first. And everybody's crowding around us behind us, looking over there. And all these new people are crowded into the bar around the end. And the band's having a good time, and the people are having a good time. And I look down in the bar, and there's this tall babe, maybe six feet tall, with eyebrows like Brooke Shields. And I mean, just beautiful. And I said to this girl, the uh, girl came come six weeks to Cindy's hospital. Can't remember her name now. But a real smart woman, obviously. And I said, do you think that girl down at the end of the bar is a Mexican? And she looks and she said, no, no, that she doesn't know the Mexican. I said, how can you tell so fast? She said, she has eyebrows. <laughs> Here's a phrase for how Hollywood uh, casting directors and commercials. Commercials, there's millions of commercials being made in LA all the time and thousands of actors work in commercials. They never get a job in show business, they get a job in commercials and it pays well. And the more times a commercial runs, the richer you get. There was a boy in my uh, film class in 1976 who was uh, 18 at the time. I was 36 at the time. And he got a, a, a job as a walk-on in a Xerox machine commercial. And it was just a big empty stage with a white background and the Xerox machine sitting there. And a secretary looking woman came from this direction, and copied something and went that way and the executive came this way. All these different people are using the same Xerox machine. So this guy's like an office boy. And he pushes a little cart out, Xerox or something, and keeps going with his cart. He got $4,000 the first year. Every time they run it, they have to pay you. And it's all controlled by the unions who know everybody's name and all that. You get a check in the mail. So even a commercial actors can make money, but you got to get the job. The casting directors want what the customer or the client wants. If it's a car, razor blade, soap, whatever the hell they're advertising, they want a certain type. They've got this concept in their brain that if we get a person who looks like this, it'll make the buyer feel like I'm one of him and I, so therefore I should use this product or whatever the goddamn psychology they're using is. And so 
my uh, wife Joanna was Mexican. She looked white most of the time until she get a tan. Then she did look a little bit Mexican, but sometimes a hint of Oriental too. So she was what the casting directors call ethnically ambiguous. That's how they ask for somebody. Ethnically ambiguous woman, 23, a part-time worker, 5'2 to 5'6, blah, 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 whatever. She had an agency that would send her the job she thought they thought she could get. And it was always ethnically ambiguous. That was the description of Joanna. <laughs> it was right. But oh my, what the PC people should say about if they've heard of that. They're all liberals in fucking Hollywood. Nobody's blinking eye. Well, that's what we have to do. It doesn't mean we disrespect the minorities. When I went to Penn State, the first year I lived in the dorm. And somehow we decided that we should have road signs we stole like every other college room we'd ever seen. So we'd steal this and that. And when I worked at Cook Forest, I knew where the signs were. We went up there and stole this great big, it was a two by eight, about that thick, that was uh, rough on one side, like rustic, you know, sawing down from the woods and had the, had the uh, restrooms or whatever carved into the uh, thing with the router. And it was all stained nice and everything. And it was hanging in my dorm. We had put two, uh, well, I was the only kid who knew how to do anything. So we got to move one of the desks over. I could stand on the desk and we put uh, dollies and hooks into the ceiling. So we had this uh, sign hanging down in front of the top half of, of the window. So you walk in the room, it's the first thing you see, restrooms or whatever the fuck it was, cook for us. And so we're, we're, we always drink in the room. You weren't supposed to, but man, you know, fuck that. There's only one guy in the whole building trying to control all these freshmen. <laughs> Good luck. So we're always drinking and drunk. And uh, my room, my roommate's name was uh, Dick Haver. He was a real square guy, goody two shoes, and he didn't like hanging around with my friends. <laughs> uh, Bud Ritz from uh, somewhere south of Knox, PA, and uh, Pete Shetler from Knox, PA, both these are high school friends, and uh, Bob Sable, who was a kid on the dorm, and uh, George Krivsky, another guy on the dorm, from the dorm floor. And we were all in our my room drinking and fucking around. And we had a darts. We had a dart game like, you know, the normal. In those days before Ralph Nader, you could have darts with real metal, sharp. Wow, somebody might get hurt. <laughs> Usually drunk college students, as a matter of fact. So we'd be throwing the throwing at the, the dart on the back of the door and thonk and thonk. We were getting bored with that. So Bud Ritz said, I bet I can stick it in that sign up there. Ah, so he throws it, bonk, and it sticks in the sign. It makes a cool sound too, like bonk. So then we all start throwing the, throwing them in the thing. And so I go over, I'm the tallest one, and I can pull all the darts out. And I give everybody the darts back. And we're, so then Bud said, let's see who can throw, throw it the hardest and see if anybody can pull it out after you throw it the hardest. So we're throwing it like baseball pitchers. We've got a finger on the end of the dirt. We can imagine on the end of the dirt and throwing it like that. And I threw one and went the tail up, went flat, hit the hit the big sign flat, went up, hit the ceiling, bounced off the ceiling, ricochet comes down point first and hits my friend Bob Sable right in the head. Donk! And the dirt stuck in his fucking skull. And then the blood starts pouring out of the fucking wound all over his face. And we're all going, ah! And one guy says, don't take it out. He's watching too many Western movies with an arrow. So Sable pulls it out himself and then puts his hand on there. We get him down to the shower and get him all unbloodied. But boy, what a shock to see the dirt sticking right out the top of his head. <laughs> oh, well. That's what we learned. Don't throw darts when you're drunk and don't try to see who can throw them the hardest. Okay. 
Sable was in on it. He just, you know, shit happens. That's what's his attitude. Good for him. <laughs> the entire dorm went home for uh, nah, some fucking holiday that I didn't want to go home for. And for some reason, they let, let us stay in that dorm. So we're, Sable and I are the only two guys in the whole dorm. So we're bored shitless. And I go down in the basement of this dorm. Now, this dorm was probably built around the turn of the century. It's, you know, it looks like a college. It's ID brick and all that nonsense. And then they had this big uh, gas furnace down in the basement, but there used to be a coal furnace down there in the old days. So there's all kinds of shit laying around down there. And I find this piece of water pipe, three quarter inch water pipe, about six feet long. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I said, I bring it back upstairs. I show Sable. I said, that could be a bazooka. We only had a rocket. And Sable said, I can make a rocket. And I said, really? You can make a rocket? Okay. So nobody, nothing to do. So Sable shows me how to make a rocket. In his high school, kids would take a match, a paper match, and get a gum wrapper and put the, put the tinfoil around the match like that. This is the head of the match here. And this is the paper sticking out. And they would put that uh, tinfoil around there so that when the match head catch, uh, catches on side there, it blows gas out the back. And away you go. So the, the whole rocket, I mean, the match and the tinfoil go that way. And they would do this to each other in class. And it's a, a live match to somebody. And I, that sounds like fun to me. So I said, okay, show me how to do it. We do it. And so we we're running out of matches. We want to make a big one because we're going to make a bazooka. So we make several prototypes and we just can't get anything to make them uh, to hold the charge long enough to go out the barrel. I mean, it goes, nothing happens. So I had an old fountain pen um, left over from, I think, high school. Somebody gave me a fountain pen. That's how old I am. We still had fountain pens. And I took the cap off, maybe like a 298 bump pin, the metal cap, and it had a clip. So I said, you know, if we put all the match heads in there and squeeze that, we can make a rocket nose out of that back. So we, with no pliers, we very laboriously figured out ways to bend the end of that. And we got it down to where it was big enough to put a match in there, just the head of the match. And we figured we have all these, we shaved all the, this, red stuff. this is a two-day effort, okay? Nobody's in the dorm. We have nothing to do. And we're shaving with the X-Acto knives, shaving the red stuff off matches, and we've got all this phosphorus or whatever it is. Phosphorus? I don't remember. And we get, fill up that, uh, that cap, and we've got it folded over there, and we put a match in there. And I said, okay, I'll be the bazooka man, and you light it. And like in the movies, we watch too many World War II movies. You, you tap me on the head, that means ready to go. So. Got it. <laughs> no, we're not even drunk. We're just doing this out of stupidity. So I'm there with my water pipe, bazooka, and Sable's back here putting the, the uh, thumb pin into the Thing and he lights it and he taps me on the head and he goes, Whoa! And the fucking fountain head went way down this hallway, maybe 100 feet, and boom, stuck in this big door. Buried itself like an inch into the door. If, we'd, if anyone would have come around the corner, it would have blown his fucking leg off. Jesus Christ. So that was, that was the end of uh, rocket launching 101 at Penn State for me. It was just a little bit too stupid. <laughs> Let me tell you some other. What did I learn? Don't fuck around with homemade rockets. That's a lot. Where teenage boys left alone will do some serious stupid stuff. <laughs> so in this dorm, the third floor was all football players, scholarship football players. And Penn State has the best team money can buy. There was a guy on the on the first on the third floor. His name was. Uh, Shit, I don't remember now, but he was a full, full Indian of some kind, an Iroquois Indian. And he was one tough motherfucker. And he was there, uh, he was a, uh, what do you call it, safety, 
for Penn State. Well, a freshman, they, he played on the freshman team. He didn't make the varsity yet. But he had a job. He was an All-American in high school. He had a job that paid $75 a week. Now, this is uh, 1957. So $75 a week was a ton of fucking money for a kid. And all he did was go over to the gym and turn the lights out at 10 o'clock. That was his job. That was his scholarship to Penn State. And there was another guy named Dave Truitt was a tight end. And he was six foot six and he looked like a Greek god. And just dumber in a box of rocks. And I would help him with his English. He was in dummy English and he would come down to my room and I would explain to him this and that, how to do it. So he, he thought I was a nice guy. So one day he said, I'm going to go through the javelin. I'm going to be in the, on the Penn State track team besides being a football player. So I said, sure, I'll come over. I used to throw spears when I was a kid. And our spears were the uh, black cherry. Black cherry goes these real straight uh, shoots up. They're about that big at the bottom. They narrow down to real thin at the top. So you take your pocket knife and you put a point on that. And then you, you throw that spear, right? So that's that was my idea, what I thought a javelin throw was. So he gave me one of the javelins, and it was really something like aluminum with a brass, big heavy brass thing on that end, really long like that. And he showed me, he said, hold your hand like that, and you run up and you try to get way down and throw it like that. So I said, well, I'm pretty good. And I go out there. So I threw that thing maybe as hard as I can. It goes about 120 feet. And he looks at me and he says, oh, you're not going to be a javelin thrower. I said, really? He said, you go get it, bring it back. So I run down and get it, bring it back. He said, watch. And he threw it, I think, 250 fucking feet. Jesus, almost the length of the goddamn football field. <laughs> and I went, holy fucking Christ. Okay. So my idea of what a college jock is changed immediately. They sure have a lot of fucking talent. So we go over to the gym. Now, this is a dumb fuck Pennsylvania boy. He's never seen any weights, you know, weightlifting. So we go over to the gym. My, my friend Bob Sibble said, let's go over to the gym and lift weights. I said, okay. We go over to the gym. It's open gym. And everything's there. And Sable gets these big uh, bar. The bar weighs 25 pounds. And then he puts 50 on that end and 50 on that end. So it's at, it's at 125 pounds. He says, okay, you just... Curl it like this. You just you're making your biceps get big. That's what you're doing like that. So I'm doing that like this. This is a struggle for me. And then one of the guys that lives in our dorm comes over. His name is Jim Bell, and he looks like a, he looks like a, a potato. He's already like half bald. He's probably 18 years old, and he has this barrel chest and a barrel belly and, and round arm, big arms, but no muscles. And he says, what are you guys doing? And Sable said, I'm showing how to do curls. And he reaches over with one hand, he takes my 125 pound thing, goes like this. He said, bam, 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 bam. The fucking weights are jiggling. And he said, you mean like that? I said, okay. <laughs> so my weightlifting career was over very shortly after that. So they're both telling me, no, it's got to feel the burn. You got to feel the burn. I said, oh, fuck. And I quit. And we're going back to the dorm. My arms are shaking. I feel like crap. And I said, well, eh, fuck that. He says, well, it's supposed to feel like that. That means your muscles are damaged. And now they're going to repair themselves and get bigger. I said, no, I'm not going to do that again. I mean, that only took one time. Man, fuck that. OK, Dave Truett, the guy that was uh, throwing the javelin was in the gym one day, and I was over there. I don't know what the fuck I was doing in the gym. So he says, Joe, come over here and spot me. And I don't know what that means. He's on the, laying on the bench. Nothing going straight up in the air like that. He says, I've got so much weight on here that I might not be able to make 10. I might be able to make 9 or 8. And if I tell you, I want you to grab it and pull it back on the cradle. You just stand there by my head. OK, do you understand? Yeah, I understand. So. He says, just put your hands on the bar now. And he goes up and down. He's going, one, two. And he gets up to seven. He says, I'm not going to make it. He said, get ready. And he, he lifts, gets up. He says, grab it. So I grab it. I think I grab it. He said, you got it? Yeah. 
And the fucking bars got him on through. I'm doing the best I can. Let two guys run over and they lift the fucking up. That poor motherfucker. If I'd have been any weaker, I would have killed him. He thought I could hold up whatever the fuck that was myself. No chance, obviously. He loved me, so he taught me a trick that made me famous and dumb fuck. Volkswagens in those days had a, a chrome wraparound bumper like this. And then at the end, it had this little chrome bar that went up and across and down, like a little bar above the bumper. And it was about an inch around. So he showed me how to pick up a Volkswagen. So we were coming through the parking lot one night. He said, watch me pick up this car. So he turns around backwards and he puts his hands down here. He bends his knees and he grabs that chrome bar and he bounces the car a couple of times. And then he straightens his legs out. He's got the car and he drops it. And that's like two or three inches off the ground because he's six six. He says, you could do it. I said, oh, fuck, I can't pick up the car. He says, it's a trick. He says, you get it bouncing. And you keep your arms straight. You get it bouncing like that. And then at the last one, you straighten your legs and just let your arms hang down there. You're using all your leg strength to lift up the car. You're not using your arms. So I do. And I get it up there. I'll be go to hell. I think this was after I plunked out of Penn State. It must have been because it was winter time. And I was outside the Captain Loomis bar. And everyone says, come on, Joe, show Mike and pick up a Volkswagen. And there was a Volkswagen there. There's a whole bunch of drunks standing around. I said, okay, I can do it. I'm pretty fucked up. So I get out there and I'm, I'm doing my thing and I stand up straight and boom, it goes down and all the other guys try it. And these are big fucking farm boys and they can't do it. So I said, I'll do it again. I'll show you. So I bounce it up and down and then, I'm get, then I stand up and I get a little bit off center. Ah! And I fucking back one. Boom, it made a fucking noise. And I just fell down on the fucking ground. And I just, I couldn't get up. It just hurt so fucking bad. And so somebody gets me, gets me to my car, gets me sitting up in a car and I get home. But that was, that's for life. I fucked up my back for life. I mean, it was bothering me until I went to Pilates when I was uh, 65 years old. I mean, it would just, all of a sudden it would just start, you have to lay down on the fucking floor for a couple of days. Ah, just to show off picking up a Volkswagen. Clue, don't try to show off picking things up, especially if you're drunk. <laughs> now that's a lesson I had to learn the hard way. There's no way you could tell me not to do that and I wouldn't do it. I'll bet you some of you dumb fucks go out there and try it now.